Well, that was nice. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Paul for inviting us. I want to thank Amy for what she said about local news and how <clears throat> August 12th was covered locally. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about local news and what's happening to local news, but I think August 12th was a reminder, and Amy's a reminder of why it's important. Um, I think I want to start, Dan, by thanking you for two things. Uh, one is I reread the book today, and I hope all of you uh, rush out and buy it, uh, because it's a love letter to America and to American values, and uh, it's such a tonic for the moment we're in. And I also uh, want to say that <clears throat> Paul told you part of the story about why Dan is here. Uh, but the truth is that, and here's where I give a shout out to Elliot Kirshner, who is uh, here somewhere, and he's Dan's co-author on this book. And within two days of August 12th, Elliot called me and said, Dan has written this book. He needs to come talk to Charlottesville. He wants to, to be a part of this conversation. And uh, Dan made it happen. So between Dan and, and Elliot, uh, just getting you here to talk to our community that's still trying to figure out uh, what unites us and what heals us, uh, I thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Dahlia, thank you very much. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here with you again. Uh, you and I see each other from time to time. And I do want to thank you for the very warm Charlottesville welcome that you gave me. Thank you. So, so um, we're a, a year and a bit into a very tough time for journalism. And uh, I promised my editor today, I was, I was slacking with my editor at Slate, and I said, the only question I want to say to ask Dan Rather is, hold me, <laughs> make it stop. <laughs> uh, but you've been through this. You have covered Watergate. You were right in the thick of it uh, in the Vietnam protests. You were right in the thick of it uh, in the DC riots and, and Emmett Till and Dr. King. Uh, so for a lot of us who are seeing real scary environments for journalism, you've lived through them. Is this the same or different? No, this is not the same. There's certainly, this is not the same. Uh, there's certainly similarities with other times in our national history, just as one can say that, you know, there have been periods in our national history when, as a people, as a nation, uh, we've been very divided before, and we're very divided now. And when we are at our divisive worst, uh, it's among the most perilous times for us. In terms of, of journalism, there are certainly some similarities, some what I would call bloodlines running to what it is now. But I think it's very important to understand that what we have been going through and are continue to go through uh, with the new administration in Washington, no longer all that new, uh, is something unique, not only in journalism history, but unique in the history of the country. That we have never had a president, and this would include Richard Nixon, who did mount his own campaign, a uh, rather forceful campaign against the press. More about that perhaps later. But we've never had a president, any president, uh, from the first moment of his presidency, even before, who personally and directly himself from his own mouth, from his own direct writing, um, has opened such a relentless campaign against the whole idea of a free press. Uh, his whole goal is to undermine public confidence in the press. And we've never had that before, particularly with a first-term president, but nothing to compare with this. Nothing to compare with a president who indicts the whole, the whole of journalism, the whole of the press, uh, as enemies of the people. Those who know even modern history, never mind uh, more ancient history, know that this echoes the sentiment of every tin-horn dictator uh, and every authoritarian regime through history. To say, now, now, while Richard Nixon did criticize the press, he never criticized 
everybody in the press and saying, these are the worst people in the world. Beyond that, uh, he has personally, and this is what's different, that the president personally and directly himself has attacked individual journalists, including mocking a journalist who had uh, some physical challenges. He has directly uh, and you know, furiously attacked individual journalistic institutions by name, and then he attacks the whole idea of, of journalism. This is new, and it is not normal. There's an effort to make, uh, to create the impression that, well, President Trump is maybe just a little better at it than most other presidents. It's not all that much different. It's pretty much what we've had before. No, this is, this is unique, and it's dangerous for the country. This is a perilous time for the country for a lot of reasons. As you know, and what I try to reflect in uh, what unites us is I'm an optimist by, by nature and by experience. But uh, there's a reality to optimism that dictates saying this is a particularly peril, perilous time. So it's one thing for journalists such as you and I to discuss well, why this is important to journalists and journalism. Uh, but our goal should be, and one of my goals of the book, I try not to be preachy about it, is that this matters. This matters to the country as a whole. It, not just to journalists and institution of journalism, and not just First Amendment rights. And it matters to the country, and here's why. That a free and independent, fiercely independent, uh, when necessary, press is the red beating heart of freedom and democracy. And if you don't have it, <laughs> and if you don't have it, you're going to have a whole different kind of government. So uh, folks who are maybe not millennials may or may not know that after 44 years at CBS, 24 in the anchor chair, sure. Dan Rather has this extraordinary new career as this internet phenomenon. <laughs> uh, not sure, I'm not sure that's the case. Thank you. And Thank you. I'm just looking at, you know, as of today, uh, News and Guts has 2.7 million Facebook followers. Uh, Dan, uh, I, you have your own Facebook followers, 370,000 Twitter followers. Dan tweets something. I know this at Slate. If Dan <laughs> tweets something that I write, like, I could put my kids through college. Like, this, this, is, this is the model for journalism. And Dan, you have become this extraordinary force in this new medium on Twitter, on Facebook. And I think the question, I have 100 questions about that. Uh, and how I am going to, when I'm 86, not that I'm saying you're 86, but if <laughs> you were, um, how I could possibly be as relevant, you know, in the Jetsons era that my, my grandchildren will operate in. You've segued into this new media, and I think what's interesting that I want to press on with you is that you have gone from the sort of dispassionate, neutral anchor chair to very forceful, very strong opinions. You're very clear, I think more clear than almost anyone about Thank the you. peril that we're in, and you call it that, and when it is a lie, you say this is a lie. And I wonder a little bit whether you wish you had spent your 44 years doing this kind of, I'm not neutral, this makes me mad, journalism that you do today. No, no not at all. Listen, uh, I can be dumb as a fence post about a lot of things, <laughs> but I'm at least smart enough to know how lucky and blessed, and I use both those words measurably, uh, to have had the career uh, that I've had and to some degree uh, I'm still having. Uh, I certainly have made my mistakes, have I ever. Uh, you know, I have my wounds, some of them self-inflicted, some of them still open for that matter. Uh, but I wouldn't, frankly, I wouldn't do it any differently. That, you know, I dreamed, I was lucky as a child. I dreamed always of being a reporter. I cannot remember wanting to be anything else. Now, my time and place being a reporter meant being a print reporter, which I tried desperately to do and did for a while. 
but because I was a remarkably poor speller, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't work out to it. I wanted to regular radio and hit television. No, wouldn't play it. I, I did try for the, the bulk of my career. I was dedicated to both the idea and the ideal that I wanted to be an honest broker of information, that I wanted to witness in whenever possible, deal in facts, sometimes uh, analysis. The reason for that being you can know all the facts and still not know the truth, and the ultimate goal is to know the truth. So now you take the facts, as we say, connect the dots into analysis. So I wanted to do straight news and analysis and to be, as I say, an honest broker of information. Now, others will have to judge, and some of them do judge, how well or poorly I did that. But that's what I wanted to do. That's what I was trying to do. Now, after I left CBS News, and frankly, I thought, uh, I can't say I thought everything was over, but I thought professionally it might very well be the end. Uh, it turned out not to be. And when I wandered into social media, uh, and I did wander into it, uh, that I had no hopes or aspirations for it. I just thought, frankly, I thought I wouldn't do it for very long. Uh, I thought, you know, I was born too soon for Twitter and Facebook. Uh, but when some younger members of my staff said to me, Dan, if you want to remain relevant, even on the margins, if you want to be any part of the conversation, it's imperative you go to social media. So I tried it. And I can say you know, that uh, no one is more surprised or amazed than I am <laughs> with the success that we've had on it. But I think one of the reasons, a long-winded way of getting around to answering your question, what, you know, what, am I, what did I start out trying to do on social media, and what am I trying to do now? Frankly, uh, I want to hang up a sign that says, you know, Dan Rather, news, analysis, and now commentary. Uh, at this age and stage, I don't think I have a lot to contribute. I've never been the smartest guy around. I'm not playing, you know, false humility here, uh, but I've never been the smartest person around. Uh, I'm not an expert on very many things. I'm a reporter who got lucky, and have been a number of places, been lucky enough to be sometimes in the right place at the right time. So what I have to offer is context and perspective, and particularly a historical context, put things in a historical context or perspective. In order to do that, I do think that uh, rightly or wrongly, and naturally I think it's rightly, that you need to deal in commentary some of the time. Now, I would say clearly that it's my opinion, uh, and it's clearly labeled as such. However, it is not an editorial, at least I work hard not to make, it is commentary. But commentary sh stops short of an editorial. An editorial is strongly advising a course of action. Vote for Mary, don't vote for Joe. Vote for the bond issue, don't vote for the bond issue. So I try to stop short of an editorial. But in short, you know, I've reached that point in my life saying, do I have anything to contribute? I'm not sure that I do. I I'm, I'm very grateful for the audience we have on social media. Uh, and I say, still very surprised and amazed for, uh, by it. But if I have anything to offer, it is, as I say, some context and perspective, and to speak with a, a, a voice of, if not authority, at least authenticity. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm struck by... Um, there's a, a sort of through line through your book, and I know I think this is, this is a word you got from your dad, the steady, the value of the word steady, and I'm always struck no matter, you know, I could be dialed up to 11. I am, I live dialed up to 11 now, but <laughs> no matter how uh, anxious I am about the, the, this current era, there is this steadiness and this, the value of steadiness, even when you're uh, overheated, you're still kind of Dan Rather overheated. There's a, there's a quality <laughs> that you bring to this, and, and I think it is a little bit of function of you have some perspective and some context. But I think, 
I would like you to reflect a little on what you mean when you talk about that notion, particularly in a time where I think as you and I have been sitting here, it's entirely possible that Bob Mueller was fired. I don't know, I'm not, that's not news. <laughs> I don't, but I'm just saying, we're in the most unsteady time of my lifetime. And yet, what do you mean when you talk about bringing steadiness into the conversation? Well, what I'm trying to do in What Unites is, is talk about some of those things, including some of the most important things that unite us as a country. I would say signs of our character, our national character. And look, we're not a perfect people. We've made our mistakes, and not everything here is the best in the world. But one thing we've had through our history, through good times, bad times, through even the most difficult and dangerous times, for example, the Civil War, of one of the great world wars of the 20th century, that overall in the main, Americans are a steady people. We don't panic, we don't run, we just hold steady. Now it's true that the word uh, has particular personal resonance with me because it was my father's, one of my father's favorite words. Uh, courage was his other. Uh, they was fond of saying that courage is the most important of the virtues uh, because all other virtues flow from it. I think he got that from reading some philosopher somewhere, but nonetheless. But the other was that I can hear his voice under any, other, any circumstances. When I had rheumatic fever as a child or I badly hurt my hand once, I can hear his voice with steady. So that's one thing. The other was then when I was maybe 10, 11, probably 10 years old, listening to the a remarkable broadcast was Edward R. Murrow from London. He had several broadcasts in which he remarked on uh, what, he, what impressed him, that under the worst of the German bombardment with moment by moment expectation of an invasion by the Germans, how steady the British were. That Ed Murrow, I could hear it possibly because of my father's emphasis on steady. But in terms of where we are now, I think it's very important to know, you know, this land where uh, the pilgrims uh, came, land where our fathers died, that we, Amer the American history has been steady. So I do think at a time when it's perilous, it's dangerous, it is an unsteady time, all the more reason to remember who we are at our core and to, and to hold steady. So, so enough with the softball questions. I'm going to ask you a hard question. Um, it's not a hard question. Uh, one of the things I love about this book, you know, you sort of called yourself an optimist. I'm an optimist, too. Yeah. I really do. Um, and I say that, you know, having lived through August in Charlottesville, but I, I still think that people have more in common than they believe. They do. I think that people are good. I think people want to raise their children and be happy and uh, live a fulfilled life and that we are fighting about things on the margins. We are being dragged into uh, exist what seem like existential fights that are not necessarily essential to who we are. I agree with that. But, and here's the but, the book is called uh, What Unites Us and so much of what you talk about and this I say as a lawyer, uh, are the values that I share of civility and decorousness, listening, process. Uh, I think that one of, and you, you make this point in the book and so I wanna press you on it a little bit. You talk about you know, growing up in Houston and the unbelievable patriotism, you know, singing songs in the car, yep. and, and yet, I, I worry, and you make the point that you sort of didn't know what was going on around you in terms of race, that everybody sort of shared the values that, that you shared, and that I, I guess I worry, particularly right now in this town that is trying to knit its way through a really fraught time, whether civility and decorousness and empathy and compassion have their limits whether they sometimes mask something really ugly that's happening underneath. And I think that sometimes the call to 
assume the best in people and to listen to the other side, uh, it leads you inexorably to the, there are good people on both sides. And that no. doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. And the question is a fair question. <coughs> the answer is that when I say I'm an optimist, I'm a realistic optimist. To say I'm optimistic based on my experience and my nature, it's not a kind of woolly-headed, everything is so many are right, everything will work itself out, all we have to do, oh, quote, all we have to do is have uh, empathy, compassion, uh, understand the difference between patriotism. No, look, we have serious country problems. As a country, we do have serious problems. And uh, on, a, on a regional and local basis, it's a rare part of America that doesn't have some problems. And it's not good enough just to say, well, if, if we can bring out the goodness of people, I agree with you. That's not what I'm talking about. It is to, to remember those things that have gotten us this far as a country, as a people. The great experiment that is America has gotten this far. What has gotten us this far? Indicating what can get us through this time, what can deal with the really ugly, and in some cases, yes, evil that's in the world, in our country, in the city. So it's not of saying, look, this is a cure-all. Frankly, one reason I did the book is because realizing there's so many voices that seek to exploit our differences, our real deep-seated problems for their partisan, political, or ideological purposes. There's so many voices, and if we aren't careful, we'll begin to think, you know, that's the voice of America. And yeah, you know what? They're right. We can't do anything about our deep and abiding problem uh, of, of race, how to get along, and the wider problem of how to get along as a something that nothing, it, nowhere in history has any people, has any society tried what we're trying to do, which is have a multiracial, multireligious, multiethnic country which can be united around some core values to hold itself together. Never been tried before. And the few times that even anything close to it was tried didn't fail. We've kept it going for what all these years now. So it, it's a let's don't forget who we are, what we are. Let's don't forget what got us this far. And let's try to apply some of those lessons to our deep and abiding problems today. Now, that I think is, is both realistic and optimistic. And look at the alternative. The alternative is to believe those who in effect are saying, listen, we've reached the point now, we've changed so much demographically, there's no way we can hold ourselves together as one nation, united we stand. You know what, folks, this is what the voice is saying. You have to go with the tribe. You have to go with, with your own, quote unquote, and you have to exclude the other because that's the only way we can move forward. Now, if we ever believe that down deep in our bone marrow, then we are finished as the kind of country that we have been and the kind of country we are. So, <laughs> and on this point of, look, we have deep and abiding problems of, outline, you know, race is just one of them, uh, income inequality, how to deal with the, the hungry, the homeless, the heartbroken, the hopeless, the voiceless among us. All of these things remain an ongoing problem. But it, you have to keep working, working on them or they'll, or they'll never get solved. That if we say to ourselves, what we're going through now, this particular time in history, I'm talking about the last year and a half to two years. We know, we know, we're better than this. This is not who we are. So, so the, I have friends in the audience and some of them know that my favorite moral philosopher is Homer Simpson. 
And that Homer Simpson has this line, he uses it about beer. And he says, beer, it's the cause of and solution to all of our problems. <laughs> and I think that that applies equally well to the media. I actually think that in this present moment, the media is both the cause of and the solution to a lot of the polarization you're describing, a lot of the sensationalizing of the most extreme voices and giving, you know, huge amounts of airtime to 0.02% of the population and their views and the ways in which the economic models for the media reward that. So I guess I want to ask how we back ourselves out of this. And I know it's an intractable problem. I mean, we can talk about Sinclair, you know, that video of the Sinclair people reading those scripts, but how do we back ourselves out of a media that is constructed of bubbles that no longer talk to each other, do not agree upon shared facts, and more and more injected into that, we're going to see, I think, in a few short years, videos that are utterly false. We're already capable of producing audio that is utterly false. Yeah. How do we, if this isn't an inexorable spiral to more of the same, I don't know what it looks like. What does the media do if anything, to get us out of the kind of deeply polarized, really, I think, almost existential attack on what we do in this project of democracy that you're describing? Well, first of all, not just the media and the press and journalism, but as a whole, we, we Americans, first thing, steady. Yes? Steady. Things to do. Resist, resist with everything in this. The, the, the effort, no. resist, resist the effort to have the country go completely into a post-truth political era. Part of what's going on now is in the political sphere is an effort to move us to a post-truth political era where all facts are fungible. There's no such thing as, you know, a fact, alternative facts, that whole thing. That, so step one is for all of us, press, media, every citizen say, I'm not moving in any post-truth political era, whether I'm a Trump supporter, a, a, a Trump opponent, or haven't quite made up my mind about it. We aren't going to go there. We need a national will at each individual, starting each individual, we're just not going to go there. The second thing, you say, how are we going to get out of the spiral? That those of us in, in journalism have a lot to answer for, and I include myself in that criticism. But as with almost every other problem in the country, it's up to the collective effort of individual citizens, which is to say, to bring it down to a baseline, People need to become more educated consumers of news. I, when I say educated, they need to be brighter and more alert consumers of news. Of understanding that there is a difference between quality journalism of integrity and most of what you see and hear. And it's up to you to determine how to find that. It takes, it's harder now for a news consumer to find a place or places where you can say, I can depend on what's being said here. These are steps we take. But again, I come back to, look, there's a lot to worry about with this. And in the post-digital age, in the age of the internet, which uh, we've only, I can't say that we're just on the shores of discovery, but it's a vast continent to which we haven't gotten to the interior of the internet. Uh, the internet has tremendous potential to, to be informative, uh, educational, news, all of that, but only if we use it for that purposes. So in answer to your question, the first thing, stay steady. We, uh, don't panic. Because panic is what those who operate at the edges, both at the extreme left, the extreme, extreme right, want us to do. A good example, by the way, which I discuss in the book, is to recognize the difference between patriotism and nationalism. There is a difference. 
They're two different words with two different meanings. And particularly in the context of the historical perspective, that extreme nationalism, patriotism is, it, the essence of patriotism is humility and an understanding that you have a deep and abiding love for the country. You're literally willing to give up your life for the country, but you always want to make your country better. And to do that, you have to recognize the things that need to be improved. That's patriotism. Nationalism is more in the spirit of beating your chest and saying, you know, we're America. We're, we're the only combined economic and military superpower in the world, so don't butts with us. That's, that's the spirit of nationalism. And we know from even fairly recent history, extreme economic nationalism led to the Great Depression. And extreme racial nationalism, racial nationalism, Aryan nationalism, led to Adolf Hitler. So you have to be, every authoritarian regime that comes to power anywhere in the world, including our own country, has at its core a desire to confuse the public between patriotism and nationalism for their own benefit. And the slope is very clear, again, from a historical side. Authoritarian regime, confuse patriotism with nationalism, get the, get the masses to believe in nationalism, and then nationalism leads to nativism, and nativism leads to tribalism, and if you ever completely reach the point of tribalism, it's just a collection of people in their own tribes, then there's no way you have a country of freedom and liberty. So, so that's a, a nice segue to my question about, and you talk about this in the book, the, the demise of local news and the ways in which, and I've even seen it, you know, we, we went from a Supreme Court that had 70 dedicated reporters to about 12, because yeah. who wants to pay for someone to sit around and watch Justice Breyer, you know? <laughs> I could watch him all day, but... Uh, we, we, we have seen the diminution of everything uh, that has to do with local news, and we see uh, more and more, you know, the Sinclair story is also a story about the demise of local news in some ways. Uh, that's an economic problem. Is there, is what's rushing in to fill that, is there a way to fix what's rushing in to fill local news? Yes, well, now here's the good news. Uh, there's a lot in that question, and more than I can possibly deal with in the time available. But when we talk about, you know, what can we do with the demise of, of local news, the demise of local newspapers, and let me say that I'm here to preach the gospel of support your local newspaper. Local and regional newspapers are, are so, so vital. And those local stations who try to do what I call quality journalism and integrity are getting rarer and rarer, and here's why. But here's, here's something you say, well, what can we do about it? Here's one thing we can do about it. We can recognize that the steady and rapid consolidation of the ownership of particularly media of national distribution uh, has reached the point, it's a danger tipping point, if you will, as recently as certainly the 1950s or 60s, there were as many as 55, 57 collection of companies that had radio stations, television stations, newspapers that could, you could say they had national distribution, some more than others, but national distribution. We're now at the point here in the second decade of the 21st century where no more than six, my count is four, but no more than six very large international conglomerates own more than 85% of the platforms of true national distribution. Now, this has happened because, and there's no gentle way to say this, and forgive my language, because what's developed is very big business is in bed with very big government in Washington to produce news programs, sometimes they should be in quotation marks, which are actually either entertainment programs or outright propaganda, in their mutual best interest. The, the big companies 
who have consolidated with hundreds, of, of, of over 100 television stations and radio stations. They need things out of Washington. They need legislation passed, legislation stopped, regulations put on, not put on. So over the years, there was a time, and follow my point here, there was a time when no one could own more than six television stations in the country. That CBS and NBC, even the networks, had six, that's all they could own. That over the years, using their lobbying power in Washington, they say, well, we should be allowed to own 12, then 18, then 35, then 40, then 60. Now, the way that happened, and again, there's probably gentler ways to put it, that your representatives in Washington, both in elective office and in appointive office, were bought and paid for. And that's what resulted. And now you have a situation where Sinclair, which is, has national distribution, has what I think 196, 197 stations, and they're seeking to add another, I think, 40 stations, if you're following the point here. Now, what we can do, it, we can say this has got to stop because it eliminates competition. It's unhealthy for the country to have four to six big companies owning 85% of the true national distribution of news. And that can be reversed. It will be reversed slowly. It can be reversed if we demand it. If we don't demand it, then the very big consolidation and media companies will continue to buy and sell politicians, uh, both elected and appointed and you'll have people on 400 television stations instead of 250. Um, I, think, I think I'm gonna ask you a question, my last question, and then we'll take questions from the audience. And, and um, you tell my favorite story in the book. I don't know if you know it's my favorite story, but it's the story of toward the very end of his career, then Chief Justice William Rehnquist writes this Family Medical Leave Act opinion. And this is a guy who doesn't typically hemorrhage warm feeling toward the needful. And yet, toward the very end of his career, he writes uh, in, a, in a really seminal Supreme Court case, this deeply empathetic and compassionate decision about the Family Medical Leave Act from a place of completely understanding what it's like to be, say, a single mother struggling to take care of kids who has um, all sorts of pressures on his time. And as you note, it turns out this is because his daughter uh, was a single mom at the time and would frequently just dump the kids in chambers and be like, I'm out. And he would have to you know, uh, watch her juggle. And so he writes this Justice Ginsburg, when she tells the story, says that her husband, when he read the initial draft of this opinion by Rehnquist, yelled down the hall of their apartment, Ruthie, did you write this? Because <laughs> it was unfathomable that yeah. Rehnquist wrote it, and you use it as a way of talking about empathy and inclusion and how men can absolutely come to understand what it's like to be a single mom struggling uh, to raise kids, but it requires listening. And your point, I think, in the book is, this is why it's important to have women on the court. This is why it's important to have uh, these connections, and this is why it's important to not talk all the time, but to listen to other experiences. So I, I guess I would just love for you to reflect. We're at a moment where it's very difficult to listen to other people. And we're very apt to say, I think the trope from the reality shows is, you know, you don't know me, you don't get me, you don't understand my story. Your whole book is sort of importuning people to get past the reflexive belief that yeah. nobody can understand me. I think this is a book about something very deep and profound, which is we can all understand each other, but it requires sitting and looking in someone's eyes and hearing their story. It does. Uh, that I think my record shows, you know, there's a saying in the news business, as there is in coaching, that you are what your record is. And there's nothing in my record uh, to indicate that I do anything deep. So I, I'm not <laughs> sure it's all that deep. No, but, but no kidding. Exactly. And part of this comes, and I'm so glad you mentioned it, 
part of this comes from, you know, I've, I've been around leaders uh, for a great deal of, of my career, both admirable ones and, and terrible ones and ones in between. And a common thread running through leaders is the really great leaders listen. They are listeners. Uh, you know, President Eisenhower, who's not everybody's favorite president, Republican, two terms, during the 1950s had a great saying. He said, never miss an opportunity to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and he said that in the context of you should listen. And exactly, that, look, we have to listen to one another. We talked before about our aspirations to be, be able to emphasize those things that unite us. And one of the things that unites us is empathy. Empathy being different from compassion. Empathy being, it's not that I pity the other person, it's that I want to understand what it's like to walk in their shoes. That requires listening. And in today's environment, I would say that listening is not encouraged. That much of the present leadership of the country, we're talking about at the very top levels of the country, is saying, don't listen to them, whoever them may be in their definition. Listen to me. We need to listen to one another. And it, it, it's sometimes difficult to do, particularly to listen and not respond immediately and say, well, wait a minute. What you just said is bunk. I don't agree with that. And get into an argument. Listen. Absorb. Think about it. And then if you want to civilly debate, this is the spirit that we need. This is America at its best. It used to happen more often than it happens today in civic clubs, Kiwanis clubs, Lions clubs, you know, personal. But I would say today, when people say to me, Dan, I'm worried. I'm worried about the country. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate you speaking up about optimism and compassion and empathy. But let me tell you, I'm worried, sick, I'm scared. And what can I do? Well, look, you know, I'm a reporter, I'm not a psychoanalyst, I'm not a sociologist, but if you want to know what you can do, get out of bed in the morning and say, what can I do today? One thing today, what can I do today to help another person, one other person? And then from that, from that, from that comes, okay, what can I do today to help the community as a whole, my local community? And then beyond that, what can I do to help the country? Now, if someone says, but listen, I, I, you know, what about President Trump? What about X? What about Y elected officials? Look, this is America. And where things get decided ultimately is at the ballot box. The Washington Post used the phrase, revenge is best served at the ballot box. That's where it's served in this country. <laughs> and recognizing that, Recognizing that, if you're, if you're afraid, if you're concerned about the country, then there's a way to remedy that. That is, get active, organize, get yourself to the polls, get other people to the polls, and have the ballot box decided. All right. That's a... You know, one thing, Dolly, I hope that uh, I recognize you're getting to the point where we want to go to audience questions. But I want to say that, you know, one of my goals for the book was not to make it an anti-Trump polemic, and it is not that. I didn't set out not to name him in a single page. It turned out when Elliot Kirshner, my co-author who's here tonight, uh, when I got the book done, he said, you know, we haven't mentioned President Trump by name. I didn't start out to write a book where we didn't mention his name. I did set out to write a book that I thought if, if a fervent Trump supporter will take the time to read it, they won't agree with everything in the book, not nearly, but they will take something from the book. Take, I think, be surprised at what they agree with. By the way, when I was asked fairly recently, had I sent President Trump a copy of the book? <laughs> well, well, frankly, I hadn't. Uh, for, you know, for one thing, how do I put this respectfully? He doesn't have a reputation of being a great reader. You'd have to tweet it at him. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. But I thought about, and I'd ask your opinion, I could send him a gentle reminder that there is an audio version of the book. <laughs> so, so Donald Trump, if you're watching, 
because I, I, I think he's a big fan of PBS. Um, if you're watching, we've got a book right here. Um, is there something you wanted to read from, from the book, or should we take questions? Well, uh, how are we for time? Uh, do folks want Dan to read? He's got something to... Yeah. Well, then, thank you. And we'll get to your questions very we'll quickly. Do questions. I'll read something short, which I feel strong about, which is at the very ending of the book. <clears throat> and I quote, I understand that my time to shape and help this world is passing. This is the circle of life. I hope now to inspire others to love this country, to pledge to work hard to make it a healthier and more just place to live. I ultimately have faith in the basic decency of our American citizenry and indeed people around the globe. I believe strongly that the core tenets I love most about this nation can be a foundation for commonality and strength once more. I believe in a wide and expansive vision of our national destiny, and I believe in all of you to help make it a reality. Courage. I was reminding Dan when we were in the green room that when they called the election the first time for Barack Obama, I was on camera with him and Dan started getting emotional and I started tearing up and I had about nine coats of mascara on and the makeup woman was right in front of me doing this, trying to get me to do whatever you're supposed to do when there's like Tammy Faye Baker ma mascara going. So that's, that's my memory of when they called it uh, for Dan. Um, there are two microphones here. Folks should line up. Um, I generally find that questions in these formats work best when they come in the form of a question. Um, and so... To the extent that you can be, you know, sort of uh, brief and declarative, that's awesome. And we'll try to get through. We've got uh, 20 minutes left of Mr. Rather's time, so we'll try to get through as many as we can. It would be awesome if you would identify yourself. Dahlia, if I may, yep. ask for an anchorman indulgence to stop the clock. I recognize we have 20 minutes. To Stopping stop the, clock. the clock. No, because uh, this is, uh, well, it's not embarrassing, it's a fact of life that I need to point out that uh, I don't hear as well as I once did. I lost 40% of my hearing in Vietnam, and age is taking care of the rest of it. <laughs> so it may be necessary for you to repeat a question or help me to understand the question. And I can't resist telling a story, which this story, as Dr. Henry Kissinger once said in another context, this story has the added advantage of being true. <laughs> Uh, that the late Betsy Cronkite, Walter Cronkite's uh, wife, uh, told this story many times in my hearing. I, I wouldn't tell it except for the fact she had told it. That Walter Cronkite lived to, to well into his 90s, and he had a bit of a hearing problem. He and Betsy liked to sail off Martha's Vineyard, and then we had some guests one weekend. Saturday afternoon came, and uh, Mrs. Cronkite said to Walter, we need to take the dinghy and go in uh, to get some resupplies, so they went in. It was Saturday afternoon, they went to their favorite store, and of course Saturday afternoon was very crowded. And of course everybody wanted to say hello to Walter, you know, there are always people who say, I, I, I want to tell you I've been watching you all my life, or have you met so-and-so, or do you know so-and-so, that sort of thing. And it took them forever to get their supplies and finally get up the cash register. Mrs. Cronkite, as she told the story, was getting exasperated because Walter was great at that sort of thing, and he stopped and talked to everybody. So she thinks they're finally free and clear. They get the cash register, and one man sort of comes from the back of the crowd and says to Walter, oh, I hate to disturb you, but do you know so-and-so? And Walter pulled himself up to his full almost six feet and said, well, I can't say that I know him, but I have met him, 
and he seemed to be a very nice fellow. Thank you very much. <laughs> they get outside, and Betsy Cronkite says, she said to him, Walter, you have to do something about your hearing. That man asked you, do you know Jesus? <laughs> So I'm, I'm happy to um, relay questions to the extent that if anyone is going to ask the question, Mr. Rather, do you know Jesus? Uh, he is going to answer as Mr. Cronkite did. Uh, go ahead. Hi. Thank you, first and foremost. Um, you recently gave a talk at the American Geophysical Union. You probably, a lot of eminent climatologists were there. And as you may know, and as I hope everyone here can appreciate, we are in an intractable climate emergency with less than five years until our first ice-free Arctic, I, in terms of ice-free sea ice in September at the height of the melt season, at which point feedbacks will cause an acceleration of warming that has not been factored in to IPCC models. So we're not going to stay under two degrees, and it's going to happen sooner than we're ready. Why do you think there's been a media blackout about these scientific facts? It's, it's a scientific fact that is underreported. And why the media blackout? It's not a matter of volume, it's a matter of clarity. I, don't. Uh, uh, I think the question is that um, there's been an almost complete media blackout about the desperate climate change situation we're in. And you spoke about this. And I think the question, and you have a chapter in your book about science. Yeah. Uh, so I think the question is, why is the media not interested in what is truly uh, cataclysmic and dire? Is that I, fair? I have it. Well, okay. you know, it may be the most important story of our time. There certainly is that possibility. And I would, I would respectfully uh, disagree with part of the premise of the question. There has been some media co coverage of climate change, but I do agree with you. Not consistent, not nearly consistent with its importance. And frankly, I think part of the reason is that those who seek to create the impression that climate change really doesn't exist as a problem, that it's part of the natural consequence, have had their effect on getting the press's head down. Uh, in essence, there's no excuse for it. Uh, that you know, part of it, and only a small part of it, is that, and there's no joy in saying this, that the current leadership of the country has in many ways led an, an anti-science campaign, which is incredible given our history, that science is one of the things that unites us from the very beginning of the founding fathers were dedicated to science. So I don't want to wander away from your question. It's in, it, yes, it exists, it's inexcusable, I don't think it's any vast conspiracy, if you will. Partly is, and let's come back to the word courage, uh, it takes a little bit of guts and a little bit of consistency to deal with the issue because there is a price to pay. And when you deal with controversial stories, frankly, I don't think this business of climate change, uh, what's controversial about it? I mean, it, it, it's a, it, it, this is true, but nonetheless, uh, for journalists, uh, uh, particularly in the present environment, and I'm not excusing anybody, but when you take on controversial subjects, there's frequently a price to pay for that, that eventually you have to face the furnace and take the heat. And the journalists are taking so much heat in so many different directions now. Again, this is not an excuse, but perhaps it can be an understanding that on climate change, for many, they want to take a pass. Thank you. Uh, controversy is a nice segue for me. My name is Amy and I work with a group of um, women's health clinics across the country called Whole Women's Health and I provide family planning service including abortion services in, throughout the country and some of the difficult parts of our country. Um, oftentimes in a subject of reporter stories and interviews and I'm interested in your take on the sort of dualism and the sort of fight that, that journalists like to cover. Sometimes sort of creating a conflict and creating a fight and creating a chasm when maybe there might not be one. 
And oftentimes in my field, um, you know, probably 80% of Americans support compassionate services when people need them for their health care and to take care of their bodies. However, most reporting does this 50-50 kind of thing where they're like, oh, let's get, let's get the other side. And oftentimes I, I push the, the reporter to say, well, if you're going to get the other side, hopefully you're going to interview eight people um, who are on this side and two people who are on the other side. But I'm interested in your perspective on how to sort of reform the coverage from the interviewee's position and what we might do to advocate to shape the narrative on some of the most divisive issues in the country and what we might do to try to hold journalism accountable. So this is uh, Amy Hagstrom Miller and Whole Women's Health, the recent abortion case that went to the US Supreme Court that she's Whole Women's Health. And um, <laughs> Charlottesville, Charlottesville is very, very lucky to have stolen her away from Texas, uh, where you come from. And the question is, in effect, this. Uh, journalism feeds on controversy, and it feeds on this kind of he says, she says, uh, you know, constructed battles. And I think the point is that at least as the interviewee in all these stories, which she was for a very long time, I know because I interviewed her, um, uh, there's this false equivalence. There's this notion that, you know, both sides are the same, both sides have merit, there's the same number of people on both sides. I think Amy's point is that in the abortion context, 80% of the public thinks that women should have access to the kinds of services right. she provides, and yet as the interviewee, she's pitted against one other person on the other side who speaks I got for... It. Okay. Well, <laughs> no, no, I mean, I mean that respectfully. No, I mean it respectfully. Because this is the problem for journalists, including myself, and again, I want to say that I've made my mistakes in this area, that in an effort to say, well, you want to, the first, the first obligation of any journalism integrity is to be accurate. And running shoulder to shoulder with that is to be accurate and to be fair. So very, very, for a very long time, it, the main spine of American journalism was a, a, a sort of constant false equivalency. If you have one from column A, you have to have one column B, and if it's a column C, have that as well. Now, over the years, this has sort of run amok, if you will, to which we now have false equivalency in so many of the narratives that it's hard to keep up. Obviously, the president made a grievous mistake when he sought a kind of false equivalency, equivalency between what was happening here in Charlottesville, but not quite a year ago. Uh, this happens time and time again, and I can understand, if not your frustration, your con concern about it. I will say that in fairly recent years, there's been somewhat of a turn in the direction of that false equivalency frequently involves false or faulty, faulty coverage. And there is some effort now to say, look, with some stories, there are five sides to every story. In some stories, there are only two sides, and in some stories, there's frankly only one side. And you have to work at it. And some of the, of, of the more traditional, and I consider to be better journalistic enterprises, are making a real effort to address this problem. But where it's at its worst is frankly in television uh, terms. Uh, cable television, but even the more standard networks it is. If you're going to put a, this person saying this, for heaven's sakes, find somebody that will say, say the opposite, and it gets completely out of balance. It's something journalists struggle with, struggle with uh, but not hard enough and not well enough. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Uh, Mr. Rather, first of all, thank you for being in Charlottesville and engaging us and sharing your experience and your thoughts. Um, Charlottesville is uh, nestled in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountain in God's country. And uh, we live uh, just outside of town at sort of a rural crossroads between uh, people who are more urban and people who are more rural. And uh, I've got wonderful neighbors. I've learned long ago not to ask them who they voted for or what party they belong to. They're wonderful people, and I'm, uh, I, I don't want to know, frankly. <laughs> um, but I want to, I've had this thought, and I'd, I'd like to hear your perspective on it. Um, 
it seems to me that the, the two, this is about party politics, that the two political parties have cast some big tents and inside of those big tents are people uh, who have various issues, but many of them are not opposite the people who are voting for another candidate on the other side. They, in fact, don't connect in any way whatsoever. There's a sort of amalgamated people with this group of particular uh, issues that are important to them and this group over here. And that in some ways, that in a, in a play for political power, um, they have succeeded in doing nothing but divide us. And, and I guess I'd like to hear from you, from your perspective, um, what is the importance of political parties at this point, and how does that make sense in, in, in where we've come along our history? So, so the question is, uh, in effect, the extent to which the political parties themselves have now constructed these big tents comprised of often single issue voters who occupy one tent or the other and may not share other interests with other people in the tents, but the parties have managed to kind of corral all of them into two camps. And I think the question, at the heart of the question is, what do we do about the extent to which the parties have done this work of dividing us and is there any utility in having parties at all? Is that fair? In, in, any utility in? In just having parties at all anymore, if all they're going to do well, is. I, I do think, and you and I may disagree about this, I do think there's great <laughs> utility and even necessity of having organized political parties. My own opinion, clearly labeled, is that we need two strong parties. That we're at our best when we have two strong parties. But I'm open to the argument that says we certainly you need more than just two. But I, as a personal opinion, based on my experience, uh, I think we do need a party system. The answer of what you do about it is, again, organize, organize others, get to the polls, and vote out anybody you think is part of this. You can say, well, God, it's so, it, it's so overwhelming. So, what? But you have to start somewhere. And again, the answer is the ballot box. If you don't like what elected politicians are doing on this subject or any other subject, if you don't like the fact that they're playing what's called identity politics to an extreme degree, then vote them out. That's the only way you can do it. I do agree with you that it, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem. Uh, it, it, it's a problem in the, in the national debate, and one of the reasons we can't get anything done in Washington is because each, each of the two parties in their own way have just set their feet in concrete and say, look, we, we don't even want to deal with the other side. And our whole country, the, including the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, our whole system is designed to have debate, civil conversation, and compromise. Compromise doesn't mean 50-50 all the time, but a compromise. It's very difficult to get that today, and your point's well taken. Say to follow up, uh, I think we have seen, to use your words, revenge at the ballot box recently. Yeah, no, he's saying it, we've seen, at least in Virginia, real revenge at the ballot box. Yeah. Uh, well, so. well uh, in, in, indeed you have, and that's one reason I used that uh, figure of speech here, uh, because that's, that's what it takes. That's what, what it gets down to. We can discuss these things in sort of the abstract or in an intellectual way of what the problem is and what needs to be done about it. But the ultimate is at the ballot box, as we've said before. That's where things get decided. Thank you. And if I could add one coda, I would just say I think a really interesting model for, for what you're describing is Moral Mondays down the road in North Carolina and the Reverend Dr. Barber, uh, William Barber, who has managed to create a tent in which he said, don't come out to Moral Mondays only because you're on the abortion front or the unions front or the environment front. Every single person comes out every single time for every single issue. And I think that that's a profound change, and it, yes. it has made radical change in North Carolina. And I think that it's not impossible to organize within the tent and to say, I know you're here because of the environment, but you know who really also cares about the environment? These union people. And you know who cares about uh, uh, the disabled? 
these union people. Let's connect them up. And so I think it's, it's important work to be done. You're right, we don't always do it, but I think that that model is a profoundly important model. Hi, um, I wanted to thank you so much for being here. Um, I am a young reporter, so having you sitting here in front of me is kind of surreal. Um, uh, so there's a lot of media bias, and you've touched on this a little bit, that comes through a lot of the material that's out right now, and that can often be because of ownership, but also be because uh, bias in media sells to you know, two essentially distinct groups of people. And I just wanted to ask whether you think that the objectivity that existed when you were reporting is still attainable. What's your name? Madeline. Okay, this is Madeline. She's a young reporter. She says it's surreal to be talking to Dan Rather. <laughs> I feel quite the same way, Madeline. Uh, Thank you. The question is about media bias and the current climate of media bias. And I think Madeline is wondering whether it's even attainable to get back to the model of objective reporting that you were a part of uh, through most of your career. Is that fair? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for your compliment. I'm unworthy of that, but I very much appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I wish you good luck as you go forward with your career. The question, the question of bias is one we could spend the rest of the evening talking about it. Rest easy, we're not going to spend the rest of the evening <laughs> talking about it. No, but the thing about bias, it, it's always been it, it, that everybody has their biases. It's unrealistic and has always been unrealistic to expect someone in journalism not to have biases. But the spine of American journalism for much of the 20th century, and particularly the mid-20th century forward to fairly late in the 20th century, the spine of traditional journalism was, yes, reporters have their biases, but the test for a journalist of, of integrity is how often and how well does he or she drain out their own biases and insofar as possible got to the truth or as close to the truth as humanly possible, and to judge the person over a period of time about how well they did or didn't do it, keep their biases out. Frankly, this is the journalism that I was raised on from the late 1940s on through the, the great tradition of CBS News through the 70s and 80s, and even in, in, it was built in that model. Now, what's happened in what I mentioned before in the internet age, what I call the post-digital age, that there's so many places for journalism and pretend journalism to be, that that, I'm happy, I can't say I'm happy to say, I think any ob observer would have to say, journalism has moved a bit off of that to the point where it says, you know, look, you can, it's a little like false equivalency, that you can bend so far over backwards trying to appear without bias that you get further and further away from the truth or as close to the truth as you can get as the facts would lead you. So where we are now, and this is true of journalism in many places, we're in what the Catholic Church calls an interregnum. I'm not Catholic, but I think it's a very handy term. An interregnum is the old order is gone or dying. The new order is not completely in place. So it's in an interregnum where journalism, as with so much else in our society, is struggling to find its new core, if you will. Now, I think we've seen some of that uh, in a very important area over the last year and a half or two years, that some of the best investigative reporting of my whole career, and I've been a working reporter, that is to say a paid reporter, for about 70 years, that's seven zero years, that this is some of the, the best investigative reporting. Some of the reporting that Washington Post, the New York Times, USA Today is a lot. And there was a time just before that when I thought really deep digging investigative reporting is probably finished. So there are signs of coming back. But on the question of bias, there are always going to be accusations of bias in the press. There will be bias in the press, including my own. I, I can't, uh, certainly would not say that I've been totally, completely, absolutely without bias for all of my career until I got into social media. Not true, not possible.
But it is important for the public to understand. It's important for those of us in journalism to understand, but very important for the public to understand that many of the charges of bias are, are frankly trying to put forward a partisan political point of view or a certain ideological point of view because they want the public to believe if Dahlia or Dan doesn't report the news the way I want it reported, then I'm going to make them pay the price for that by calling them something that usually starts with bias. And I once used the metaphor that there was a time in South Africa, when I was covering South Africa, follow me here, when if someone in the community did something that others didn't want, they'd put a burning tire around their neck. Well, metaphorically, people want to put a burning tire around journalists' neck to say, he or she doesn't report it the way I want it reported. Therefore, I'm going to say they're biased. I want to call them a liberal or a left-wing bomb-throwing Bolshevik or something equated to that. Or, on the opposite side, I'm going to call them you know, a reactionary and reprobate. But as a reporter, and I'll try to end this too long conversation, as a reporter, the best you can do it be able to look yourself in the mirror in the morning and at night saying, I did the best I could to set aside my biases and to tell it what I witnessed, what I know, as honestly and truthfully as I can. Because once you begin to pay attention to what people are calling you, what people describe you, then you run the risk of really being true as a journalist worth reading or worth listening to. Because you just listen to the people who are accusing you are constantly trying to adjust and say, well, you know, they call me reactionary, so I need to move to the, to the left. Or they call me a, a liberal, I need to move toward the, toward the center. Once you get caught up in that, so just frankly try to do the right thing. And for everybody who wants to call your name, take some version of the L with them. So we've actually gone over time, and I'm getting, I'm getting the eyeball, and I really do apologize to the folks who are standing in line. Um, I want to take one second to say, uh, on behalf of this amazing uh, crowd in this amazing town, that we thank you. And I think I also want to say, when I started reading this book, I thought, you know, I, I want to live in Dan Rather's America. It's a much nicer place than the one uh, I live in. And, and when I finished reading the book, I realized I, in fact, do live in Dan Rather's America. And I am thankful uh, every day that I do. So thank you, Dan, thank you, Dan. for being thank here. You, Dan. Thank you.